here in what is known as Ravenshore in a little village called Helm Shore right where I live and it's here whilst it may look tranquil pleasing relaxing whatever words you want to use unfortunately it was here back in the early hours of September the 4th, 1860 that the residents of Helm Shore would be woken obviously from their sleep to the sounds of a dreadful collision Believe it or not, this is called, or it used to be called Little Blackpool. We don't really term it like that nowadays. Um, I don't think many people actually know it's called Little Blackpool. But um, yeah, back in the old industrial days, 1800s, mid to late 1800s, this is where families used to bring the kids and they used to spend the day, full day here. You know, river walking, paddling, sat on the slabs, if you will. Just basically chilling uh, and you have to remember back in the old Victorian days I keep saying old Victorian days but back in the Victorian days obviously money was very hard to come by they worked long hours um, so they had to take uh, as much time with the families as they possibly could and this was the ideal location simply because it's scenic it's easy to get to it's accessible like I say uh, and it's just, just a nice place to come and relax. So yeah, Little Blackpool. And this is in a place called Ravenshore in Helm Shore. And like I said, this is, uh, this is the tale, which we're now talking about, of the uh, fateful rail crash that occurred back in 1860 on September the 4th. And we'll talk more about the events that led up to it and how it occurred shortly. train came across the Ravenshaw viaduct all the way up and around. Within seconds of it leaving the bridge here there was another train that had rolled back all the way from Helmshaw station. When I say all the way back it was about 400 yards and within seconds of a second train that had left New Bailey Station in Salford 
as it's left this, this viaduct here and it went further across just on the bend on the incline the second train was on its way down so as you can tell or as you can imagine it would be it would be a scene of just utter destruction many people lost their lives that morning 11 in total as it transpired with 77 badly injured the toll would have been much higher than that but the uh, i think the official count was 77 uh, truly horrific morning and we're going to go to the scene where that took place shortly now this as i've already said this area especially was known as little blackpool back in victorian england we don't really know it as that now like i said but um, it's a very tranquil quiet place families would have been brought here I have got some photos from the 1800s which I'll put over the top of this video footage now um, and nothing's changed, nothing has changed I've just been down looking at these slabs down here because apparently there is supposed to be some scratches, some engravings from which kids put back in the 1800s I can't actually see them, I've had a quick look um, whether or not they're further across the riverbed, I don't know they may be in that direction and across there but yeah, apparently you can actually find engravings, if you will, from kids, you know, back in the day. I'd love to find them to show you guys, but I just, I just can't see them. But yeah, we're going to carry on and we'll talk some more about the events that took place on September the 4th, you know, and to what transpired that early morning. Now, I know this part isn't obviously related to the accident that happened that morning, but I've just come across this, which I think some... Oh, I know one or two of the people I chat to a lot on Twitter and on YouTube who might be impressed with, but look at the old drain pipe here that cuts through, cuts through the wall. And obviously it goes all the way down. Broken in places, you can see it, but it's all shattered. But obviously that leads into the, uh, into the River Ogden. Just there. Now the good thing about doing this video today is nothing's grown back yet from winter so obviously we can get to see these these things in more detail which is pretty cool right may have found a way up to the actual railway that has been blocked off at both sides now i came here mid to end of last year when we originally covered this story for the podcast over on www.daysofhorror.com I never knew this bit existed to be fair, <laughs> to be fair. God it's a steep hill but look at this, how cool is this? Lanc Lancashire Yorkshire Railway didn't even know that was here. That is brilliant. Obviously you can't see as much on that side. Out of breath. Cart. Lancashire, Yorkshire, Railway Storm. That's a neat find. Right, let's get to the top. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Buzzing isn't the word, guys. I can't believe I've actually got onto it. Didn't know we could get up here last time I came. This is the viaduct, Ravenshaw Viaduct. This is where the train, the railway, that morning, 
sorry, not railway. I'm out of breath. This is where the train came up here along this line. You can see the embankments, the trees have come down, the walls are still here. <sighs> I'm absolutely buzzing. Didn't even realise we could get this way. I mean, obviously, there's nothing much left. But wow. This is crazy. <sighs> further on, uh, further on, further ahead, just through the tree line. As the, I don't know if you can see it through the trees here, but as it goes round, it actually starts to go upwards. And as it goes upwards, that is where the two trains collided. As the trains departed New Bailey Station, they made their way into Helmshaw Station here. And in the first train, that went through nicely. nicely. It went into Aslindon, it went into Accrington, it made its way nice and safe. As the second train arrived in Helmshaw, as it pulled alongside the station, the carriages shunted. So the brake lever, the chains, apparently they snapped. And I think it was 15 carriages that rolled back down. Now as they rolled back down the incline from Helmshaw Station to this point here, unbeknownst to them, well, obviously not unbeknownst, but the third train was fast approaching over the bridge here. So as the third train's coming up here and the second train is coming back, or the carriages are coming back, the driver of the second train, um, he, has managed to uncouple the actual engine from the front, put it onto the down line to come back down here in the hope of getting in front and then obviously putting the brakes on the carriages to stop them. If it failed with that, it was hoping to get in front to stop the third train from fast approaching. It was too late. The trains collided just over there, just beyond the tree line. You can see where the railway line used to go. And there is an incline. You can see where it was down. I'm not sure if the camera's picking up properly, but that is where the two trains on that fateful, well, fateful morning sadly collided. With obviously 11 lives lost that day. So, as for the actual. Got a horse here. So, as for the actual victims, if you will. You know, the ones that sadly died that morning. Um, and as for the seriously injured, well, they were taken to a public house, which was then called the Turner's Arms. And we'll go there shortly. But basically, the, um, they were all taken there to be looked after. The crash itself led to 10 people being sadly killed, uh, badly mangled. They were crushed. They lost, they lost limbs, arms, legs. It was a horrific scene. But as for the survivors, some seriously wounded, well, like I said, after they were taken to the Turner's Arms, um, many of them eventually made their way home one way or another, you know, to places like Accrington, Blackburn, Haslingdon, Burnley, you know, and other surrounding areas. But there is a story of one gentleman who he survived the initial crash, but was badly injured. Uh, and he sadly passed away, I think it was about a week or so after being taken to Manchester Hospital. So that was 11 victims on that, uh, on that fateful morning, September the 4th, 1860. But like I say, this is the area just above the, uh, the hill line here, just where those horses are now. But that is the area where the actual collision took place just in that area there. So it's actually not too far from the embankments of the, I think it's the River Ogden, which is just down here. So yeah, so just in that distance, that is where it took place.
and I'm not sure if this is coming through properly but when I last came here we saw these metal structures here I don't know what it is it's, I mean it's obviously iron of some, some sorts now it would be not in a grim way I mean you can see some here some kind of pulley system I don't know if the camera's picking up right well and then obviously there's another one if anybody knows what these are or what they could be can they comment down below I mean there's some more coming through here but it would be uh, interesting to know exactly what they are I mean considering the actual disaster took place just above this hill line here in some dark well I don't know what's the word to use but in some dark way it would be nice to think that these could be possible leftovers from the actual train itself now I know that might sound a little bit a bit grim I mean, you can see another one here again it's definitely iron of sorts But it would be nice to think that maybe, just maybe, are these artifacts, you know, from the actual train itself, from the trains that collided. Some might say that's a bit dark and a bit disturbing, but, you know, I mean, if there's remnants here, if there's relics here, that will be an interesting find. Somehow I don't think it is. I actually think it's probably part of the old... Um, I think there was some kind of foundry going on around here, some kind of, there was some business anyway. Um, and we'll see remnants of that shortly when we just get around this bend. But yeah, I, I mean, I just personally think it's something to do with the buildings, it's nothing to do with railway itself or the trains, but it would be nice to think that there is something there, not in a ghoulish way, but in a nice little kind of memorial, you know, just to remember those that sadly died, you know, and obviously the accident that took place that morning. Philipson, Bolton. It's not the first brick we found flying around. There's another one there. Another one here, buried. Another one there. So there is a lot of industrialisation or remnants of industrialisation that took place here and from what I gather there used to be some kind of works going on just here all across here I mean you can see the sluice gates that are just in the distance not sure you can see it on the camera but there's some sluice gates there you've got the waterfall but there's definitely remnants here of times gone by I mean we're talking like mid to, mid to late 1800s so obviously you know there's been a lot of a lot of work around here just in front of me now you can see some kind of stone work I mean that's obviously some kind of angled rock as well but it's everywhere on this walkway this path there's one there there's another one So there is remnants definitely on this uh, path and if you know this area and you've never been obviously um, I'll put links to walks, paths if you will and then uh, make your way down here because it's interesting especially for like Victorian history and the stories that we talk about Another piece here Well like I said, if anybody knows what those metal structures were that we showed you earlier Comment down below, tell me what you think they could be. It's definitely iron of some of some sorts. Now, amongst all, obviously, the destruction and the chaos, the death, the badly injured, there was two stories of miraculous survivors. One being a young girl. Now, she was trapped beneath the wreckage of one of the engines for hours, and I mean hours. No crying could be heard, nothing. She must have been in bad pain and it took them hours before they recovered her. She actually left the wreckage with not a single scratch on her. Made her way on. Amazing really when you think about it, what happened. And then there's also the story of a drunk who had literally 
because some say five, ten minutes before the actual trains collided, he fell asleep on one of the actual seats in the carriage. And as the trains hit, or the carriages collided, he was thrown to the floor completely oblivious to everything. Just like the little girl, he walked away without a scratch. Not a mark, not a bruise, nothing. He actually came, came round from his drunken stupor when he was being pulled from the wreckage. And I think, I'm not sure what his entire words were, but it's something on the lines of, what's to do? I mean, imagine, you've just been involved in one, or if the, not the fatalist, rail crash to take place in these parts, but to actually take part in it, completely oblivious to it, to what happened, considering the noise, the destruction that would have took place, but to walk away without a single idea as to what happened, the mind baffles. How he did it, just don't know. But yeah, two, two quick tales there of survivors that actually walked away from such a bad and a horrific event. Now, people had been over to Manchester to watch a brass band contest that took place at Bellevue Gardens. Um, now, they reckon there were up to 20,000 people that day that attended the actual contest. Now, these 20,000 people had to get on somehow. So, trains were put on, more trains were put on. And when I say more trains, I actually mean more carriages because, like I said, there were three trains that left that evening to come back towards Ramsbottom, um, Helmshore, Haslingdon, Accrington, you know, the surrounding places. But 20,000 people. Now, when you put that into context now, three trains covering that many people, roughly, and then obviously fate intervened and that collision took place here in Elmshore. 400 yards in that direction down to where it happened. Now, obviously the inquest took place and nobody was found guilty. There was nobody to blame. Some people say the coupling, or the couplings I should say, literally snapped because basically what happened was as the carriages came to a standstill at the station, they, they rebounded off each other, snapping the, cou the couplings on the chains. Um, and obviously that left 15 carriages to free run back down the incline, which obviously again, I keep saying it's in that direction. And I'm sure station used to be in that direction, which we're going to go to in a minute. But yeah, so obviously they've gone down the incline. Now, they say they checked the couplings back at New Bailey Station in Salford, because they do all these checks obviously before trains leave or they depart the stations. Now, the station master at the time said, he saw no problems, absolutely fine. But obviously, they could have been defective. It's, it, it would be difficult to tell. You, it, so I can understand why nobody was blamed. The driver did nothing wrong. He wasn't speeding. He didn't slam on. You know, there was nothing to point the finger of blame to anybody. And it was put down as an accident. However, what did come out of it was um, they made all owners of these railway lines, these railway companies, culpable. So going ahead, any further accidents that led to cause a loss of life, I should say, they will be held culpable for it. Obviously, imprisonments, huge fines. You know, the, the strongest of punishments that could be afforded to them would be given to them, all because of the actual disaster that took place here in Helmshore. So changes were made shortly after that event. So some good did come out of it in the end. Just making our way to the original station master's house, if you will, that still stands today, and it's probably one of the only features still remaining from back in 1860. Now we have to be respectful because 
obviously it's no longer a station master's house but it's somebody's actual living premises now so yeah we have to be mindful of that when we do these videos but that is the original station master's house and as you can see you've got like an old some kind of lamp stand or whatever it is and that still remains in situ and just to the, the gateway, the driveway, you can see the station master's house, obviously block. But these are the only features really that stand from back in 1860. Because of the beaching acts, that took place around, I think, 1966. Obviously, a lot of local railways were made defunct, they shut down. But the old railway, Helm Shore Railway used to go where these houses are here. Again, we have to be respectful, but it used to come across here and it used to go all the way through them gardens just down there. And that is where the collision took place, just further back where all those houses are. Now, here where this house is, it's bungalow and a bit further back, that is where the old Helm Shore station used to be. Now, I have got some pictures of Elmshaw Station, so what I'll do, I'll put them over this video so you can all see for yourselves what it used to look like back in the day. Um, there used to be a footbridge that used to go across here, a platform. Um, I've got a photo of that, I'll try and dig that out and I'll put that over the top so you can see that as well. But yeah, we do have to be respectful because like I said, these are now um, where people used to, well, people still live, I should say, not used to live. So we have to be respectful, we can't just go, obviously, intruding on people's living spaces. But as you can see to the left, that is where the old railway used to run along. Now, we're going to go to the station pub now, which used to be known as the Turner's Arms, and this is where the bodies were taken that morning. And it's just up this road here. I don't know if you can make that out, guys, but there's your plaque. Helmshaw Railway opened 17th of August 1848, closed 3rd December 1966. And that was closed because of the beaching axe. The original box home shore rebuilt in 1990 by Alan Dunn. Same surname as me. Sign there. Navarag line, so that's it. Railway cottage, 40 yards down drive. That's down there. You can just about make out, just in the distance, the old viaduct, the old bridge. And there's the station masters. House, the plaque, whatever you want to call it, on the gateway. It won't be long. It won't be long. It won't be long. So in front of me guys is the station, also known as the Turner's Arms back in 1860. And it's here, exactly where the bodies and the badly injured were brought. And as you can tell because of Covid today guys, it's, uh, it's very very quiet here, for obvious reasons. But that is the station pub. Now do you remember guys when I said that the bodies were brought to the station, right, I'll, behind the pub, there used to be a barn. Now, so I don't think we'll be able to see much now because they've all tents and stuff that have been put up. Um, but just behind here is where the barn was originally situated. So this is where the barn would have been, just behind the actual turns on, as far as it's known now, the station or pub. I like to see you've got your marquees up now and your benches outside for obvious reasons, like I keep saying. So that was the story of the Helmshaw Railway incident of 1860. It's a sad one. Um, it did leave a mark on the residents and on the village of Helmshaw back in the day. Because let's be honest, things like that in these little villages where I live generally don't happen. Um, but this was a truly horrific morning, if you will. Um, 10 people at the time lost their lives with another person shortly after, so 11 people died that day um, or were involved in a bad accident that day I should say 77 confirmed seriously injured casualties 
probably more than that, probably into the hundreds. But if you want more of this story, visit my website, www.daysofwarrior.com, where I did the podcast, I did the full script, if you will. Um, we've got photos on it. There's a lot more to the story than what I've probably told you on this video. But if you did like this video, comment, subscribe, give us a thumbs up, um, take care of yourselves, more importantly, and I will be back soon with another tale from the past. <laughs>